queen. Wow. Any challenger should join her on stage. Any challenger. So beautiful. That's so beautiful. So beautiful. So beautiful. supposed to even welcome us before we start doing our thing, but because he's a father and he's somebody who loves us all, he still has time to stay and he's here just to welcome us and to tell us a little bit about Ningo. We've heard the name Ningo, Ningo. We don't even know what it stands for. So I think we will give him our ears and then we'll listen to what Nene has for us. Nene. Oh, Fane, Dan, was she a Dan? So I feel like Dan is the same thing. So Nene. Hello. 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 Yeah, MC uh, I'm very happy to be part of this program. I'll talk briefly about New Ningo. The whole Ningo is a very large area with, a, with very big history, custom, and tradition. So I just talk about New Ningo. Uh, 101 years ago, uh, on the wall, you see Tai Jangma the first on the wall outside. He was the man who was the paramount chief of the whole great Ningo. And then uh, violence broke out. The township was bent. And then the man, I don't know if some of you have gone beyond this town to the lake, uh, the lagoon, sorry. He crossed the lagoon, came down here, and then he said he was coming to form a new town. So the whole town was New Ningo, and then he came to form New Ningo. So from that lagoon down to the small stream down here, when you go in that valley, uh, that stretch of land is called New Ningo. And uh, that is my jurisdiction. Down to the Central University, around the Aflau Highway, the whole covers that area, uh, and uh, the population is about 1,700 now, with two electoral areas, that is two assemblymen, is under the Ningu Pampram district, and then the constituency, and then uh, we all <coughs> here abide by all the rules and laws of the, every citizen of Ghana. We have different culture and customer uh, norms and traditions we believe in. And then I don't, I don't think we have time today to go into that. Yes, but uh, basically, I, I just want you to know about Ningo that uh, in the ancient times it was called Jangbama. 2,300 and something years ago, it came to now. And then uh, there was a fort there in Old Ningo, now called Old Ningo, called Fort Friendisburg, built by the Danes. And then they used to transport uh, human, that is human slavery, human trafficking through that uh, area. And that changed the name from Jangbaman to Ningo. Thank you so Absolutely. much for coming. Once okay. again, I'm Nenete Jangba the Fort. Thank you. Thank you. Please round of applause for Nene Te Chang Madifov. Nene Te Chang Madifov. So to my brothers and sisters, I think this goes particularly to you. Nene Te Chang Madifov. He has just given us a brief history of Ningo. Okay, I'll ask names. What's your name? I'm Mustafa Rohana too. Eugenia J. Sechi. Esther Benson. I'm Ironya Akuma. Announce your school. Pram Pram D. Basic A. Say it loud. Pram Pram D. Basic A. 
from Prom DA Basic A. That's what I'm talking about. Here we go, Stephen Biko, I'll give them the mic. Steve Biko was born in the year 1946 in the Eastern Cape region of South Africa in a poor Zosa family. He was born in a system called Apartheid. Steve Biko was a good student who attended the University of Natal where he studied medicine. First, he joined a group of white students who claimed they were against apartheid. Apartheid is the terrible system where the blacks were denied political rights. This means they have no any say in, in any political affair of their country. The white students thought they were better than the black students. So Steve Biko and another black student formed the South African Students Association, where they started a movement to teach black consciousness. Steve Biko, as a poor boy by then, had to endure this system of apartheid for a very long time. At a point on time, he and his family were driven out of their locality to other places due to the attack of the British. Black consciousness means making blacks aware of their intelligence, ability, courage, beauty, and achievement. After the black consciousness movement began to spread around the country, the white controlled government banned the people like Biko from speaking in public and even from moving freely around their own country. The white who ruled the country knew that the people liked Steve Vico and were listening to his message. Steve Vico had to begin traveling in disguise. One day, he was in a car that was stopped by a police. He was arrested again. The new apartheid was wrong and would have to end. The South African police arrested Steve Vico several times just to scare him and once left him in jail for 137 days without even charging him for a crime. He was taken to the police station, stripped of his clothes, beaten and chained for days. He finally suffered bleeding in his brain. He was never sent to a hospital. He was beaten many times by the police. Once his friend met him, he had bruises on his body and was limping. Steve told him, this white are really beating me now, shall we? But I'm fighting back but they are going to kill me at the rate they are going. On September 11, 1977, the whites put him in a car, still naked and chained, and was taken on a long journey. By September 12, Steve Biko died. Steve Biko will be well known and respected as a patriotic citizen in South Africa. This is the end of our presentation on Steve Biko. A round of applause, please. A round of applause, please. That is beautiful. Give it up for this beautiful African lady coming up. Okay, what we have here is we have one young lady here who is going to tell us some of the background of Yaa Santua that a lot of you know. And then, of course, a lot of you know Yaa Santua's very famous speech to her men. And so we know this young lady will give it all the flavor and power that it deserves. So we'll let her say something about Yaa Santua and then... This young lady will tell you how she sounded at the time. Hello, I am Ama Kanban and I am presenting for the Black Tastic School of Abibi Fahori Adis Yabia, which is African Liberation School. And I will be doing Nanaya Asantewa, some of her background. Ye wo na na ya asante wa wo ahinime da eto so do afe afe apem ahawache adrianang ye wo no wo besia se wa asante mantam a nemrei abeka gana ho ya asante wa na oye ni apening wo abusia mu Nenya Afrane Penning, now di hene woe dresso, a bang besiase. A bra nenya di hene no. O hunu se a santifone o mo ne a brofo koye efiti a fe a pem a hawache a doche mienta de copem a fe a pem a hawache a doche mwache. Ebra nen ya wue ya no. Ya santuwa na oma yesi ne babema no adreso hine. Bra abrofo ne de adreso hine ne nana asante prampe a odikang. 
No car said to let support. War I fear. I pim, I haoche, I do crong and siamuno. I do for say, will pass out what an assy cardiac officer. Na and mamma will walk be na, na, on moon pass out will beckon. And tea, ya, nana ya, Santa wa, ne, ma, wa, Santa hono na, on moon, say, by ya, one hen and no, na, besamba. Nana ya asantua ne asante for ma ene abrofodi kun na wo akokodro ne ahoding a ode koye ni pada so di nan nana mon echi besi sadai please give it up for her she just told the story of ya asantua Ya yeah, Santua was born on October 17, 1840, in Bisiasi. She was the queen mother of Ejisu in the Ashanti Empire, now part of modern day Ghana. She led the Ashantis in the War of the Golden Stool or the Ya yeah, Santua War against British colonialism. She was a warrior queen. She was exiled to seashells in East Africa, where she died 20 years later, at the age of 81, on October 17, 1921. She is an inspiration and role model to girls and women across Africa because of her bravery. Thank you. Please give it up for her. Hezekiah Emmanuel. My name is Mary Dede Maunge. My name is Naomi Gale. My name is Michael Akwe. We are from Prampam DA Basic B. We are here to give a representation on Morris Repent Bishop. Morris Repent Bishop was born in 1944 on the islands of Aruba, which was then a colony of the Netherlands. The Africans were brought to Aruba a long time ago to work as slaves on plantations to make money for the people of Dutch. When he was still a child, Maurice Rupert Bishop moved with his family to the British colony of Grenada, like the Dutch, the French, the Portuguese, the Spanish, and others. The British brought Africans to Grenada to profit from black slave labor. Grenada was a very small, poor island country in the Caribbean. Whilst Bishop was growing up, he was always tall for his age. Sometimes children used to tease at him. He was a very good student. When he left for secondary school, he went to England, where he studied law at the University of London. Whilst in London, he read a lot about Julius Nyerere of Tanzania on how he organized his society. He became more aware of his position as a black man in the world. He soon moved back to Grenada and started his own political group. He joined with another group to start the new Joel. Joel stands for Joint Action for Education welfare and liberation. The group wanted to make life better for the people of Grenada. Next, Maurice Bishop got himself into politics where he won an election as a member of parliament. In 1974, in 1974, Bishop and his followers took power when the corrupt leader of the country was on travel. Bishop and the new Joel movement went to work. Whilst in office, he made sure Almost every one of his country learned to read. He created thousands of jobs for his country and increased food production so that his people do not have to get food outside of their country. School fees were reduced and he began constructing an airport for tourism. But he still had problems because another group in Grenada also wanted power. They captured Bishop and took him to a military building and killed him with others from his government. A few days later, 
the tiny country of Grenada was attacked by the United States military, who never wanted Bishop in power, even in the first place. This invasion hurt or killed hundreds of Grenadians, but the people of Grenada still work hard to make Grenada a better place to live. Africans around the world still honor Marius Bishop and all the good things the new Juba movement did for the people of Grenada. This is the end of our presentation. Thank you. Another great, another great African. Another great African. Great African. Amna Ayoko van der Poy Ogo from Love and Action Good News Club. Tema. My name is Blessing Atta. My name is Kumsin Raymond. My name is Oponsa. My name is Casey Agamet. We are here to represent the history of Sheikh Antajiop. Sheikh Antajiop was born in Senegal, West Africa, in 1923. He studied chemistry, physics, philosophy, anthropology, linguistics, history, and Egyptology. He finished his PhD in France in 1960. Sheikh Antajiop believed that the history of Africa had not been properly told, especially the history of Africa's now valley where ancient Egypt was. The black Africans there named the land Kemet. This is what the land was called for thousands of years through its period of great civilization. Much later, the Greeks changed the land to Kemet. Since Dr. Diop had been educated and trained in so many subjects, he was prepared to investigate ancient Kemet and its people. He even created his own laboratory in Senegal to help him with his work. Ancient Kemet was an African civilization that gave the world's modern mathematics, chemistry, astronomy, philosophy and writing. For thousands of years, the Africans of Kemet became the world's masters at this subject. They also built the great pyramids of Giza and other great monuments. Later, Europeans mainly from Greece came to Kemet as students to learn from African masters. Many historians and Egyptologists from Europe and America did not want to admit that this great civilization with its great dynasties and pharaohs was an African civilization. Sheikh Antajob and his partner, Tophen Obinga, went to a big meet in the United Nations of scientists and Egyptologists and proved that ancient Kemet or Egypt was a black African civilization. Job and Obinga proved they were black by checking their languages, the names Egyptians called themselves, the kind of blood the Egyptians had, the West of Europeans who met the ancient Egyptians, the kind of furniture they used, and even the Bible. The studies of Sheikh and Tajib are very important because African people should know our true history because many of us don't believe that we were the creators of the greatest civilization in the world. That is the civilization of ancient Kemet, also called ancient Egypt. Sheikh Antajop was great that the University of Dhaka in Senegal changed its name to Sheikh Antajop University. This is the end of our history. Thank you. Thank you. A round of applause. Round of applause. Round of applause.
Edward Wilmot Blyden presenters, please come up. Gosh. Give them a round of applause for as they come up. Thank you. Now let's hear the introduction from the teacher. I'm Messi Agbetiafa, and these are students from Abia DA Basic. We are doing a presentation on Edward Wilmot Blyden. Thank you. My name is Ernestina Jangba. My name is Obed Ruth. My name is Elizabeth Sakloko Ai. My name is Stephen Buachi. Good. We are doing our presentation on Edward Wilmot Blinding. Edward Wilmot Blinding was a Liberian. Born on August 1832, he was the son of Frey Brax. Romeo Etela, Judith, a school teacher, and he was the third of seven children. While in Portobello, Venezuela, he began to develop a facility with language. He also became more acutely aware that the majority of people of African descent in America were slaves, and this affected the future course of his life. Upon returning to St. Thomas, Edward Raymond Bryden attended school, completed a five years apprenticeship as a tailor. He grew interested and became a minister. After meeting a Dutch reformed minister, Reverend John P. Noyce. Knox was instrumental in Blyden's decision to come to the United States in 1850 and seek admission to Rogers Theological College. Blinding was prevented from entering the college because of his race. Less than a year after entering the United States, Blyden emigrated to Liberia with the support of members of the American Colonization Society, the ACS. Once in Liberia, Blyden entered school. His education enhanced by travels to Europe, the Middle East, and throughout um, Africa. Blyden thought was contained in his book, Hope for Africa, Christianity, Islam, Negro, Race and African Life and Customs. He also wrote many articles for the ACS Journal, the African Repository. Throughout his lifetime, Blyden held the view that black would never be wholly accepted as equal in America. Much of Blyden's life was spent in pursuit of political goals. After being appointed Liberia Secretary of State in 1864, he served until 1866. He used his position to encourage the genuine blacks rather than the mulattoes. He left the country after narrow escaping, being lynched in an atmosphere of political instability caused by warring function. He was appointed as Minister of Interior and Secretary of Education in 1880. He also made unsuccessful attempts to become Liberian president in 1885. Blady was in poor health and received a moderate pension at the instruction of the colonial secretary. From the governors of Sierra Leone, Lagos, and Good Coast, he died in February 7, 1912. His racial favor made him a symbolic figure for future generations of nationalists. In 1858, he was ordained a Presbyterian minister and accepted a position as principal of a high school in Liberia. He also edited government newspapers, the Liberian Herald. In 1880 to 1884, he was elected as the president of Liberian College. Although he was not able to receive formal education, his vision for Liberia and for all people was defined in his writing. Give it up for these little ones. Give it up. This is the end of our presentation. Now we're going to break a little bit from the school and we're going to do uh, Imhotep. Now we have two young people who have done Imhotep separately, but we're going to both let them do uh, similar versions because they both prepared and we both we want to let them get a chance to do their thing. We have two people doing Imhotep. Some of you may know Imhotep was a multiple genius, so sometimes it takes multiple geniuses to describe him. This is why we have two here. Uh, we'll let them introduce themselves. My name is Ernest Abagra Johnson. 
My name is Zakaya Desiree Gamato. Imhotep. Imhotep was born for more than 4,000 years. He was an African from ancient Kemet. Kemet was the name they used for their country thousands of years ago before the Greeks came and called it Egypt. Imhotep means he who comes in peace. Imhotep was the world's first multi-genius. This means he was an expert in many things. He was an architect who designed and built the famous step pyramid in Zakara. He was also a medical doctor. He is known as the real father of medicine. His medical writing shows how to treat 48 injuries. More than 2,000 years ago, before Hippocrates, the Greek father of medicine, Emhotep was also a mathematician, a poet, and an astronomer, which means study of the stars. He is an expert in many things. It's in our history, and it's in our blood. Thank you. Very good. Emhotep was a polymath. A polymath is basically what he said, a expert in many studies like an architect, a poet, a mathematician, and many other things. And the Romans had their temples, and the Romans had paintings and writings, and praise, actually, Emhotep, and now they're saying that they somehow didn't know him. <laughs> but... <laughs> It's true. And um, <laughs> M. Hotep was a multi genius, just like he said, and just took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> he said, Oh, he said, Joyce took the words out of my mouth. You took the words out of your sister's mouth. I think some of you might have seen this boy wearing something similar to mine. This is where we look like Africans. And his dad, I think you heard the surname. This is Jerry's son, Jerry Jr. Yes, the brain behind all this, this is the junior. So he's going to take over <laughs> some years to come. So Jerry, I hope you are prepared. So your sister will help you. You're going to take this over from Jerry in the next 50 years. 50 years. She says sooner than that. That's good. All right. <laughs> so please, give it up for them. Give it up for them. Yes. The movie Black Panther. There was female warriors in that movie, and they were modeled after female warriors that we really had. And I'm convinced female warriors that we will have again. So, we're gonna turn it over to these youngsters to let you know all about it. I am Princess Angele from Jindas Preparatory School. I'm a teacher. I'm Emelda Ayi. I'm Rita Ebua. I'm Jennifer Kwakupo. And I'm Beatrice Dapo. Together we are students from Jindas Preparatory School. We are coming to do a presentation on the Dahomey female warriors. In the year 1708, King Agaja became the king of Dahomey. He made a group of women his guards and gave them guns called muskets. Then King Agaja trained these female warriors to become soldiers to fight against other kingdoms. These female soldiers were called the Nomitim, which meant our mothers in the local language. When Europeans first saw these female soldiers, they called them the Amazon. The Namitan soldiers have to train very hard. They have to climb trees and bushes filled with thorns, barefooted with little clothes on, do heavy exercise for a long time, and learn how to survive in the forest with almost no food. They became experts at hand-to-hand -hand combat, fighting with their hands. They protected their king and also attract other kingdoms with great skills. Time the Europeans started to turn African land to their colonies. There were not as many Nomitons as 
they were before. By then, the Europeans who wanted to rule Africa were from French. By then, the king of Jaume was a man called K King Benhazin. The female warriors joined the male soldiers in killing them, in fighting them with the French. Thank you. King Benhazin's army fought two big wars with the French. The Second World had 23 battles, and the Nomiton fought in the front of the Dahomey army. Because the Nomitons were females, they were put in the front of the Dahomey army in order to intimidate the French soldiers. The Dahomey men and female soldiers killed many, inv many of the invading French soldiers. But in the end, the French army had too many guns and cannons, so they won the war. When the war was over, the French were able to colonize the homey, the same way the British colonized places like Ghana and Nigeria. But the French soldiers told everyone they met that the Nomitons were strong, fierce, and brave soldiers who fought them to death. We honor these women for fighting so bravely to keep the French from taking their kingdom. Presently, Jahomi is called Benin. This is the end of our presentation. Thank you. Give up for this young ladies. Good afternoon. These are the pupils from Old Ningo Presby Basic A. We are doing a presentation on a life story of Didan Kimanti. Long before Didan Kimanti was born, the British have come to Kenya and began to take their best farmland away from the Africans there. This upset the Africans because they were using that land for hundreds of years before the whites came. The British knew they could be rich if they forced the Africans to work for them on the land that they are taking away from them. But the Africans did not agree, especially Kikuyu. They did not want to be slaves to the British on the land, on their own African land. Since the British used guns and weapons to kill the Africans who did not want their land to be taken away, the Africans took off a way to fight them back. So they started the Kyuku Land Freedom Army to fight for freeing their land from the British. The Africans were forced to live on bad small land, which the British called Native Reserve. Idan Kimati is not happy about this system as he grew. So he became the leader for the Land Freedom Army, which the British called Mau Mau. Since, since the Africans don't have the guns the British had, they have to go into the forest and attack the British when they had chance. Kimati made the people in the Land Freedom Army so take an oath and swear they will fight against the British and have their land taken back away from the British. The Land Freedom Wars with the Brit lasted more than 10 years and helped the Kenyans to gain their independence and also helped the Kenyans to end the colonization by the British. Lilan Kimati was finally captured by some African soldiers who worked for the British. And he was educated by the British, but he was known today in Kenya as a great hero. In summary, Dina Kinata was Kimati was born in 1920. In school, he liked debates and poet, poetry. The British referred to him as a terrorist for fighting to get their land back. But in Kenya, he was known as a great hero. He, was, he died in 1957, living four children, two boys and two girls. His statue was in Kenya today, and many things such as road, schools, and football stadium were, was named after him. Former Ghana President John J.J. Rorris named his son Kimati in, in the honor of Kenya's freedom fighter. From all we have said, we can see that Didan Kimati was a great hero, and this is the life history of great Didan Kimati.
Loretta Braco is my name from Pram Pram Presby. We are presenting Nani from Jamaica. Thank you. Queen Nani, as she was called, was a Maori leader in Jamaica. She was born in 1686 and died in 1733. It is believed that the name Nani came from about Nana, a common Akan name by the West African country called Ghana. It, Maroons were slaves that had escaped from slavery after being transported to Jamaica and set up, set up their own lives to live free from slavery. Queen Nani and her four strong brothers were brought by the Europeans to America and the Caribbean island. Unfortunately for the British, Nani and her brothers escaped to a place called the Blue Mountains of Jamaica. It therefore became very difficult for the British to penetrate to attack them in battles because they were always on lookout. Nani is strong, rebellious, and had special fighters, which when their own cord is abandoned, is blown they all gather and join the others in the Nani town. <coughs> Nani and the Maroon had to fight many wars in order to gain their freedom. The war la lasted from 1720 to 1739. Nani was very stubborn. They tried to penetrate and fight against Nali. She was very powerful. Nani had many achievements. Nani stood in for her people during wars. She even cut, cut bullets from gunshot with her bare hands. She also preserved Africa culture through the way they dress and the song they sang. The government of Jamaica honored her as a one of the seven national heroes. Her picture was also placed on the $5 note. She was also awarded with the right of excellence. Thank you. A round of applause. Please round of give applause. him a round of applause. That's about Nani. About Nani. From a royal from Jamaica. <laughs> we haven't heard from the queen yet. Look at her. Is she ready? <laughs> this is Malebna Johnson. And today, who are you going to tell us about Malebna? Apoko Kanyane. Malebna is going to tell you about Opoko Kanyane, a fra fra woman. You saw her the very first picture on the front of the wall. And Malebna is going to tell you all about her. So please, please, please pay very close attention. Hello, my name is Malebna. I would like to tell you about a woman named Apoka Kariane. Apoka Kariane was a far from woman from the north of Ghana. Long ago, young Apoka and her brother settled in a place called Bukere. This was the time when Africans were being caught by slave, slavers and sold to work as slaves outside of Africa. When the slavers came, the people of the village would run to the bush so they wouldn't be captured. One day, the slavers came, but they didn't see any men. But they saw Apaka Kariane pounding millet with her pistol, and they asked her where the men were. But she did not understand their English. But she pretended to point her pistol to the bush, right when the slavers' boss were going. Apoka quickly turned and crushed the head of the slaver's boss, and he collapsed and died instantly. And the rest ran away and never came back. She is a hero to her people. Now in the north, they sing her praises, Tandunga Lebgezin, which means the pistol turned into blood. Yes. Whoa. Very, very wonderful, wonderful. Give it up for her. Give it up for her. Uh, Give it up for her. Malevna. One last entry with someone I didn't know about myself. So this is a piece of history that's not on the wall yet, but based on what this young sister has told me, uh, I think we will have another entry on the wall very, very soon. Please come up. Please give it up for her. All right. Thank she you. wants to give tell us something interesting. Um, hi, my name is Anna. Uh, I'm 12 years old, and today I will be talking about um, Alda de Espiritu Santo, who was a combatant.
for the liberation of Saint Tome Principe. For anybody wondering, Saint Tome Principe is a island an island off the west coast of Africa. Um, Aldo de Spiritu Santo was a politician, writer, educator, and poetess. Poetess. She was born in Saint Tome Principe. On, the, on April 30th, 1926, she spent her childhood and her teenage years there until 1948, where she traveled to Lisbon, Portugal to study to become a primary school teacher. Whilst in Lisbon, she met a couple of people who she then, like, let's say, collaborated with to then create Centro de Estudos Africanos. Um, this, this translates to Center for African Studies. These are some of the people who contributed into m making this project happen. First of all, we actually have somebody who is on the wall, who is Amilka Cabral, and he was um, he was a politician as well, I'm pretty sure, because he was in the party, Partido Africano de Independencia de Guiné y Cabo Verde, which translates to Independence Party uh, for the freedom, you know, of Guinea Bissau and Cabo Verde, Cape Verde. The next person is from Angola. He was an ex-Angolan president. His name was Agostino Neto. He was in the party Movimento Popular de Libertação de Angola, which is the popular movement for the liberation of Angola. We have the next, who is Marcelo dos Santos. He was in Frente de... Libertação de Mozambique. He was uh, in the front, Liberation Front for Mozambique. And then we have Alda, who we are talking about today. She was in the Movimento pela Libertação de Santo Tomé Príncipe. So the Liberation Movement for Santo Tomé Príncipe. Uh, in 1951, Alda returned to Santo Tomé Príncipe and she worked there as a primary school teacher for some time. She was imprisoned it, from 1965 to 1966 and was called a, for being a subversive. A subversive is like a troublemaker. She is the co-founder of her party, which I had just mentioned, and she was part of the transitional government after Saint Tome and Prin e Principe became independent. After Saint Tome Principe became independent, she became Minister of Culture and Education from 1977 to 1978. From 1978 to 1980, she was Minister of Education, Social Affairs and Culture. And then after that, she was the president of the National Assembly. She had also written the national anthem for Saint Tomé Príncipe. And then in 2010, March 9th, she died in Luanda, Angola. And beca because of this, the government for Saint Tomé Príncipe uh, declared five days of mourning for her passing.
We have um, three, four elders with us right now. And we've talked about our ancestors and the ones that are, are gone. But we have people who are here who have stores of knowledge that we still haven't taken full advantage of. Um, I think I'd like to bring up three, uh, four people. And we're going to have just a little bit of discussion here about where we are and where we're going from the eyes of elders who've seen a lot more than we have. So I'm going to ask um, Mama Marimba Ani. I'm going to ask Baba Chinwezu. I'm going to ask the double Babas here. <laughs> you see them sitting there together. We're going to ask you t also to come, Sid and Rufus. So we're going to ask them to come. We're going to just talk, let them talk a little bit and see if we can um, glean something out that we can use and take forward to push for the empowerment of African people. I think we would be remiss if we passed up this, what I consider to be an opportunity to have this much long-term perspective analytical thinkers and experienced warriors among our midst. So I'm going to do a brief introduction of the three of them. And I'm just really going to ask you, I'll ask you a couple of questions. But the questions will be around where we are and some of the things that we maybe could have done differently and where it is that we need to go. I know that's very broad, but I'm going to let you do what you do. Okay, now my introductions. Baba Rufus Martin is from Mississippi. He lived in Los Angeles a long, long time, and I was there a long time, and I knew his place, but I didn't know him. I've had the pleasure to meet him since I've been in Ghana. He's had a long journey. He's here now in Ghana after living in Los Angeles, Las Vegas, back in Mississippi, and ended up back here home with his roots on the ground, 98 years old. 98 years. And thinking Please. about. One by the child, look at your heart, woman. I came 98 years and he's still walking on and, his feet. And planning his next 98. Yes. The child, look at your heart, planning his next 98. I came and look at your child. I came in America. I came in America. I came in 98 years. I came in Ghana. I came in Miami. The 98 year needs something. The talking grounds have to say something to welcome him. Welcome him the African way. Short and brief. Good. 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 That's good. That's we welcome African heroes. Thank you. Okay. So, All right. right. Now we'll move on to uh, Tenwezu here. Tenwezu. Uh, some of you have been reading, Tenwezu. Studying. Please mention the name clearly. What is listening? Uh, listen. Listen. Uh, mention the name clearly. So that, yeah. Tenwezu. Ah, uh, Tenwezu. So many of you who've read some of the work. Hopefully, you've read some of the things of Western. The rest of us decolonizing the African mind. Uh, we were talking about uh, Imhotep earlier being a multi-genius and also having um, uh, a high degree of competence in multiple areas. Well, this is what you're looking at here when you look at Chinwezu. And we're uh, lucky enough, uh, maybe not for the best reasons, some of the reasons were health related, but we're glad to have him here in Ghana with us and uh, sharing his knowledge with us. For some of you, you may not have known, about two or three weeks ago, they had a full conference at Legon uh, on the works of Chin Weizu, with uh, scholars coming from all over the country and in, indeed the world to discuss some of his works. And then finally, we have Mama Marimba Ani, 
Um, Mama Marimba Ani. Okay. Yes, Mama Marimba Ani. I'm leaving the doctors off of all of these uh, terms, but uh, suffice it to say they've uh, also done the academic work. Mama Marimba is a dedicated, dedicated African woman. She was here, through here, during Nkrumah's time. So some of you, uh, you're looking at a person who's seen it from both sides. So she traveled as a young woman through Africa. She was here during those times, and uh, she's dedicated her life to the uplift of African people. Some of you may know her by the works uh, Urugu, um, which was a book that all of us tried to read, and we slowly got through it in our study groups. Very challenging, but also very rewarding. Okay, I've gone far enough. I'm going to ask each of them just to give some basic perspectives and some things that, since we have some ears here, maybe it is they would like us to hear. Okay, I'll start with Baba Rufus. Thank you. It's such a wonderful pleasure to see you here today and to be so happy and together. That's the one thing that we have failed in, but we are getting much better, is being together. Uh, Jerry had asked me uh, to do the uh, oath to the ancestors uh, this morning, and we didn't get to it. So I feel like in leaving, we can do the oath to the ancestors, which was written by an elder African, unknown African, and it goes like this. Oh, ancestors, blacker than the skies of Newt at midnight, pyramid builders and great ancient priests, warriors and mystic scientists, give us the inspiration to fight a thousand lines. Give us the enlightenment to unravel the mysteries of this universe. Give us the substance to travel through the trackless swamps of disharmony. Oh, ancestors, praise be your African name. Amon Ra, Mayat, Hotep. Thank you very much. Thank you, round of applause for that poem. Very short poem. It's like a poem and it's a prayer for the African. I won't take up any more of your time, and I, you, you will never know how much I appreciate seeing all of my people here to work with my brother Jerry, who is one of the, one of the greatest men in Africa. Uh, and he has permitted me to be in a partnership with him, like on the wall and a library. And thank you so much for your help. And may the blessings be with you. Round of applause, please. Round of applause for our daddy, our daddy. It's my pleasure to be here, to see this audience. And um, for those of us who they say have taken our boarding passes and are waiting in the airport lounge <laughs> for the great flight to join our ancestors, to see what we can say to you that might click and inspire you to do what you have to do. And I'm only going to say a few things about some distinctions we should keep in mind. One is the difference between freedom and liberation. Freedom and liberation. Our people fought for freedom. In the 1960s, a lot of our countries got what they considered freedom, but they did not get liberation. So the task awaiting the next generation is to move on from freedom to liberation. And when I talk about freedom and liberation, the other distinction we have to keep in mind is between autonomy and sovereignty. You can get autonomy but not be sovereign. Try and figure out what the difference is between the two. The other distinction I think we have to take very seriously is between racial 
and racism. Race simply refers to the different groups of a species that are on their way to diverging. You have a species, some sections of them begin to develop some characteristics that others don't have. So at that point, you have two different races. And at some point, they can no longer interbreed. At that point, they change to become different species. So how does that impact on us? Part of the trick of the mind that has been foisted on us, those who conquered us, who enslaved us, had a doctrine about race, racial superiority. They claimed they conquered us and ruled us because they were inherently superior. And that was the doctrine of racism that they had to give themselves self-confidence and to keep, give us inferiority complex. Now, as black people begin to rise and challenge their racism, which is a doctrine of racial, inherent racial superiority and hierarchy, they begin to spread confusion and tell, and tell us that there's nothing like race. But as Geoff pointed out, does that mean I can see no difference between a blue-eyed Swedish blonde and a black-haired Zulu? Race, they are race. You can't deny it. But the trick they are playing mm -hmm. is to tell you that when, if you are being racial, you are being racist. Mm -hmm. In other words, if black people come together to organize themselves to fight their en white enemies, instead of saying, yeah, you are being racial, they say you are being racist. But there's nothing, racial does not mean racist. It only means you are concerned with the affairs of one group, one race of humanity. But the trick is to make you stop organizing as black people. Absolutely. Because when you do, they say you are a, sh a black chauvinist. Meaning that you are trying to impose black superiority. But racial has no sense of superiority. It just says we are different and we want to take care of our own business. So whenever they come at you and say you are being black, a black chauvinist or that you are being a black racist, just ignore them and resist them. Because the point is, you are not preaching white, black superiority, which is what racism is about. You're not claiming that blacks are inherently higher than whites. As long as you are not doing that, you are not a racist. So don't get, don't get intimidated by the accusation that you are just trying to be like the whites you are condemning. So that's the second distinct set of distinctions we should all keep in mind as we go out to battle in life so they don't discourage you and frighten you into the asserting your freedom and your liberation. The, th the other distinction I think that's important is between sports, being a sportsman and being a warrior. We, a lot of us use the term warrior, but do we know the distinction? Do we know what a warrior entails? Now, the way to get at it, in my view, is to distinguish between a, sport, between a sports person or sportsman and a warrior. A sport is a competitive game in which there are rules and the referee to enforce the rules. So if you are a footballer, a boxer, a karate expert, you are playing by certain rules and if you disobey the rules, you get penalized. You want to win within the rules. But the main point about being a warrior is that in war, there are no rules. So you, you must win by any means necessary. That, that is a very That's important wonderful. point. In warfare, you struggle, you fight to win by any means necessary. In sports, you don't do that. So if we get that clear, a lot of people who claim they are warriors you'll find are not warriors. So we should tell them to go back to being sportsmen. That's and it. if we want to succeed, we must be warriors. And to be warriors, if there are no succeed. rules, so you fight by any means necessary. So keep those distinctions in mind. I think you'll have a chance to win the struggle for our liberation. So black Africa can, in the way Marcus Garvey advocated, turn itself by creating a black superpower in Africa so that it can defend black people wherever they are in the world. 
if you don't have a black superpower in Africa, you'll be disrespected no matter who you are or where you are, so long as you are black. Because your black skin color is a badge of powerlessness. So far, it is a badge of powerlessness. If you see somebody who has a black skin, you know you can do anything you like to him. Nothing is going to happen to you. If you see somebody who is white-skinned, you know if you do something, even if he's alone in your village and you do something nasty to him, all the white powers will descend on you. You want to create a situation where white people, wherever they see black people, will know that, ah, this lonely black person, if I touch him or her, we've got to answer to somebody. Somebody is going to force us to do something, to pay, pay a price for it. It's only when you get that that you, are, you can claim you are now sovereign because nobody can mess with you in any way or shape or form. So if we want sovereignty, we must know what sovereignty means and we must know what it takes to acquire it. Thank you very much. Know the differences between sportsman and warrior, difference between racism, racial and race. And then she know the difference between autonomy and sovereignty. The difference between freedom and then liberation. With this, you can fight and win wars. And at the end, he said what? If you're a warrior, there are no rules and regulations in war. You win by all means. So let's put it at the back of our minds that we Africans, we're going to fight for our liberation. That was clarity. Now we'll move on to some more clarity. Uh, Mama Marimba, Ani. Uh, I hope that everybody uh, will hope to say uh, we brought a little group with us and we came all the way here because we wanted to support the work that, um, as we call him, Baba Jerry is doing here. Um, and he and his wife and the others who are working with him. So I think what, what I would uh, like to just make mention of is the importance of this ancestral wall. And I came because it is a, uh, a place that African people are going to have to come to. I'm not going to say it's the only place. I hope there will be others. But it is a place that we will know as an African person have you been to the ancestral wall? That's going to be the conversation. And anybody coming to Ghana is going to know that they have got to include that in the itinerary of what they do, and people will be coming on their own. And the reason for that is that the concept here is uh, both profound and it is also very, very, very ancient. And the idea is, it's not just about pictures on a wall and information about those people who are in the pictures, but there are layers of, of significance of what this represents. It has political importance because it is uh, our ancestors actually that make us one. We share the same ancestors. That's why we're related. We used to have a saying back in the States, uh, the brothers used to call each other blood. I don't know if you all are old enough to remember that, anybody here uh, from the States. But that's what they were talking about. We share the same blood. That's very important. It has um, cultural significance because obviously that's where our cultural origins come from, is our ancestral being. And then it has very deep spiritual significance because as we get deeper into the concept of ancestor, what we find is that we are ancestors. In the African conception, ancestors are reborn. 
It's not a matter of reincarnation. It's a matter of a spiritual energy that, that continues, that, that is reborn. And so in the African conception, spiritually, each and every one of us to be born and to be sitting here has to represent an energy that came from before our physical existence. That's very deep. That's very heavy and it's very real if you're African people. So wherever we go throughout the world that is the African world, African people, I don't care where they are, they have a special feeling about who they call their ancestors. So for me, that became the really important spiritual concept because it is a political concept, because it unites us, because it is common to all of us. So we can use that to build the consciousness that has to be built. And if I were to speak of, um, Baba here talked about um, freedom, and you talked about liberation, then we move even beyond that, because these are steps. Because liberation, then we're still talking about what are you liberating yourself from? What are you freeing yourself for? Sovereignty becomes the objective. It becomes the goal. It becomes the vision. And it pushes us and pulls us and gives us that, that inspiration so it tells us, why am I doing this? What is it that I need to do? That's what I want to build. And that's what has to happen. And we say nothing less. World African sovereignty, nothing less. That's it. That's what we work for. So that, that's why I'm here, is because I look for the various ways in which we contribute to that, that river, so to speak, as Vincent Harding would say, um, of uh, the movement towards the achievement of African sovereignty. And it, it's very important, you see, that, that we are clear, as we saw the emphasis earlier today was on the children. And Jerry's emphasis is on the children, because it, in the children we have to develop a certain consciousness or we will continue to be stuck and be on a treadmill where we do the same thing over and over, but it's not moving anywhere. And if we look at the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey, I mean, we're talking a century ago where his concepts were so powerful. And then what happened afterwards, it's like we went backwards. Because we haven't reached where Garvey was at yet. And that's what we have to do. We have to move in that direction. Now, um, what I also came to do at, at Jerry's uh, request was to bring some ancestors. And so we actually came prepared to do that, to help people connect with the energy of some of our ancestors who were indeed warriors and not sports people, who were uh, working for us and looking to achieve what they could by any means necessary. So I wanted to bring specially Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, 
And if I speak as her, if you allow me to do that for a moment, then what it was that I attempted to do was to help you, my people, understand that there was only one racism, one functional form of racism, and that was the system of white supremacy, the cause of which is a wraith of people who are convinced of their own inferiority and therefore are afraid, are threatened by those who have the power to, in their minds, extinguish them. And so they built a system and a structure in which they became superior and are able to use that structure and that system to convince black African people of their inferiority. And I call that process the process of inferiorization. And that was the work that I did and that I would like to see continued. And I wrote some things, and I said some things. And one of those was, woe unto the people who fall in love with their oppressor and learn to hate themselves. Their path will be filled with chaos. And so I did this work, and in the work that I want people to pay more attention to is not just what I said about white people, but what I said about us, what I said about black people, what I said about the power of black people, what I said about black fear and what black fear does to our thinking and causes an inability for us to think strategically, an inability for us to plan, an inability of us to analyze our situation. And I talked about, you see, like Jerry, my focus was our children, too. I devoted my life to the healing and support of black children. And one of the most important things in that process of, of raising black children is parenting. And what parenting will take for African sovereignty and for African world revolution, as Nana John Henry Clark would say, is that we must be mature. We must work on ourselves. We must commit ourselves to our children, to our youth, and put them first in our lives or we will be, again, stuck in a syndrome of incompetence and fear. We have to be able to give our children confidence and give them the courage that they are going to need to take over this world and to take it back. And so a lot of my work that people need to look at seriously, please, is about black parenting. 
is about how a people who respect themselves, a people who love themselves, you can tell by how they treat their children and where the children are in their lives. I came from a family of race people. I had a, a grandfather who they called a race man, grandmother who they called a race woman, who was close to the grandchildren, I myself knew them, of Ida B. Wells. So that connectedness was very important. And I just decided the work I was going to do for my people. And I saw what needed to be done. And I wanted to do it with a group. I wanted us to do it together. But I said to myself, if nobody else will do it, I'm going to do it. I'll do it by myself if I have to. And so they called me Harriet Tubman of the black world, the current black medical world. That's what they called me. A lot of people called me that. And what I think that today that we have our mentor Harriet Tubman has come here among us. I think maybe if we call her the chill come, come up here and sit with me and help me. Maybe Harriet Tubman will come. We got to look at the energy and the power that we can get, you see, because energy doesn't go anywhere, that we can tap into. And here she comes, Mama Nana, our mentor, Harriet Tubman. Thank you for that, Nana Francis. I was born in 1820 in Dorchester County, Maryland. Born into the brutality of chattel slavery in the South, in the United States. But that brutality, it didn't end in the United States. It didn't begin there either. It began on this land and many other countries along this rich coast. I want you to close your eyes for me. Close them. Imagine your ancestors, a deeply spiritual people, being ripped away from their homeland, dehumanized through rape and beatings. I want you to imagine the fear that they felt walking along the coffles. Smell the stench of the dungeons and the overcrowded slave ships. I want you to hear their cries as they screamed being taken away from their homeland to a foreign place, never to see home again. And now I want you to open your eyes and remember, remember the less than human beings that did that to our ancestors, the white man that is still our enemy today if you are Ga, it is not the Ewe. If you are Ashanti, it is not Hausa or Fanti. No. Our common enemy is and always has been the white man. One person that was very clear on that is Nana John Henry Clark, and I call him today. Nana Clark, please come forward. History is a clock. that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. History is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. History tells of people where they've been and what they've been, where they are and what they are. But most importantly, history tells of people where they must go and what they still must be. The relationship of history to a people is like the relationship of a mother
to her child. Born in 1915, small sharecropper family. We were sharecroppers, but we were wealthy, wealthy in humanity. The way that we treated each other, the love we shared, especially uh, my grandmother's, as she taught me to be an African and that we were an African people. And I always had that question as I looked at the world around me, why did those that seem to work so hard have so little and those that work the least have so much? It wasn't fair. So I decided to find out. And I dedicated my life to discovering our story, the story they try to leave out of history that is his story. Because he had no story without our story. Our story is the story of humankind. And it has been a continual story. We must remember that History is a current event. Those things that happen now are a continuation of what is happening. Now, what am I saying? What I'm saying is when you look at the world today and you see the things that you go through and you see the life that you live, it has been because of the things that we as a people have done. We've allowed uh, people to come into our home, take our children, kidnap us, take us to foreign land. Now, we understand enslavement. Let me be clear. Enslaving is the process of stealing a people, but not simply stealing a people because you can't control a people simply by stealing them. You must take from them their culture, their connection, their ability to think because the ability to think is the ability to connect to your ancestors. And once you lose that connection, you lose the connection to your home. But if you take the flip side of a people's greatest strength, you will find their greatest weakness. We invited the stranger in, offered him food, allowed him to sit at the table. Who would think? that the stranger, after feeding at the table, would rape the mother that fixed the food and then enslave the host. But that's the people we dealt with. Whether they were coming into ancient Kemet, into Ethiopia, or traveling to any part you saw them do this, first in the form of the desert people, you know, the Arabs, and then the Iceman, the Europeans. And many of our scholars, you know, humbly I say myself, uh, Chancellor Williams, many of my teachers, we have written and taught our story. But obviously, we're not listening. Because today, we have the European in our home. We treat him as a guest. He disturbs our culture. He has our men disrespecting our women, acting as if uh, they're not equal. 
how can a people disrespect the womb they come from and honor a deity that looks like their enemy? I traveled through Ghana, because I'm still here, in the form of all those that's fighting for African liberation. And I see these uh, pictures of blonde haired, blue eyed, uh, painted by Michelangelo uh, characters. And, you know, Michelangelo was commissioned to do this. And he made them, the models were his cousins. When he didn't have enough models, he went to the jail and got some more. And he made these pictures. And you have them in your home and you worship them as if they were God. And they don't look like you. So a man and a people should only worship what looks like them. You know, when Africans made their gods, Europeans made theirs. So why is the African wor worshiping the Europeans' god? These things are confusing, but they cause the detriment of a people. We have to look at the events. Every people that have come into Africa have come meaning no good to the African. Everything, every institution they've brought has been about their power and their power over African people. Since the time of her rule, they have come. And if you know your story, you know this short period that we've been in for the last maybe 25,000, 100 years. It's been a short time. Most of human history had happened over half of human history before the world even knew there was a European. But continually from the Arab to the Europe, they've come in and we've accepted them. And now you're accepting the Chinese. It's, it's, this is disturbing. Are people supposed to learn as they grow older? That's the point of an elder. But if the elders are acting foolishly, well, let me take that back. Elders don't act foolishly, only olders. You grow old with no knowledge because you don't study. You don't look at your people, and you don't look at the people you're dealing with. But if you were, you would understand the difference. Now, I know I, I, I can't be long, but there are things we need to understand. That if history is a current event, and we're experiencing the things that have been experienced that has caused the African people's detriment, we have to look at what we've done to rid ourselves of this problem before and why it reoccurs. So we have to take the time to look at the things we've done and look at the things we've done wrong, even if it breaks our heart. So we've got to look at these things. And we've got people that set the standards for us, people that had the true project that knew the process, but because we didn't take them by the hand and protect them and make sure their programs were done, we lost the effect. So therefore, people like Marcus Garvey, who I think we need to take another look at, a serious look, need to be investigated and seen the good he had the largest movement of African liberation and sovereignty that we've known on the last 3,000 years. So 
we need to take time to study that. Because the true purpose of education is to make the student a proper handler of power and to make the student reliant on himself. So we need to hear from Marcus Garvey. We need him to come and share with us his thought, his idea, and when you've heard it, you need to go back and read and study. So we're calling him that Marcus Garvey might come and share some thought with Marcus us. Marcus Garvey, give him a round of applause. We're going to hear the story. We just heard it from Clark. We heard it from Tubman, Clark, and now Marcus Garvey is going to tell us his story. Please listen carefully. My name is Marcus Garvey. I was born in the Caribbean island of Jamaica. After traveling the world, I recognized that in every society I visited, black man was at the bottom of the ladder. He was at the bottom. So I asked myself, where is the black man's government? Where, are, where is the black man's men of big affairs? Who looks after the interests of the black man? There was no one. So I formed the UNIA, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. The aim of the Universal, Inf Universal, Improvement, Universal Negro Improvement Association includes, it's an organization among blacks seeking to improve the condition of the race with view as of establishing a nation of in Africa where blacks will be given the opportunity to develop by themselves. The, U the UNIA and Africa Community League is a social, friendly, humanitarian, charitable, educational, institutional, constructive, expansive society and is founded by people desiring to the utmost to work for the general upliftment of the black peoples of the world. The members pledge themselves to do all in their power to conserve the rights of their noble race and to respect the rights of all mankind, believing always in the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God, to establish a universal fraternity among the race, to promote the spiritual the spirit of pride and love, to reclaim the fallen, to administer, the, to administer and assist the needy, to assist in developing the independent black nation and communities, to establish a central nation for the race, to establish com commissaries and agencies in the principal countries and cities of the world for the representation of all blacks. In establishing universities, colleges, academic schools for the racial education and culture of the people to work for, for better conditions among blacks everywhere. The motto of the organization was one God, one aim, one destiny. Our people, as we, as we moved along, Ghana gained its independence, and who I regard as one of my students, he took up the baton. And I'd like to call Kwame Nkrumah to come and say a few words. Good evening, esteemed comrades, Africans. I am honored to have been called here tonight to lend my voice to these great African perspectives and points of view this evening in what was formerly called along the Guinea coast, more specifically Ghana, more specifically Pram Pram. What I will contribute is that we should see liberation as has been discussed as a process and a matter of perspective. On the eve of Ghanaian independence, I said that 
the independence of Ghana was meaningless unless linked to the independence of all African nations. That is a matter of perspective. That independence has not been achieved yet. And thus, I say to myself, to my esteemed comrades all gathered here, that we must continue to work towards that goal. Those of us of the, that generation of African independence in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and so forth, we are proud to have laid the path and to be held in such high regard by all of you, but we were just human beings, as you are. So I ask that all of you, in the same manner, remind yourself that we had nothing that you don't have. In fact, you have information and hindsight that we, do not, we did not have access to in our time. So once again, I say, remember these things. We have written books for you to also learn from, and you two are adding your own books to this knowledge base to make ourselves functional and effective Africans. Neo the, my book, Neocolonialism, was not a book of prophecy. It was a book put together by the analysis of the facts at the time, comparing that standard colonialism to what was to come after. So today, when you look around and you see those factors that I said would come about, this is not divination, but simple scholarship. So, in the same way that we are all human beings, and I've also said that Africa being united can become one of the greatest forces for good, on Earth, we have to continue to work towards that goal and think as Africans of thought and also of action. Thank you. A kere finu shabon, bara kwetu, ajuba akoda, ajuba asheda, ajuba yinra iwaju, emile roe hin. Bi eko lo ba juba, ili alano, omo ti ki juba, ki bakpa, ki nko mashi ya wanyo dudu, ti a jafon ominura ya wanyo dudu, enko on ti a nilo, enye ni, isho, is for what so wakpa, lari ya wa ya wa, enko on ti a nilo, enye ni ominura lari ya wa, lari mbobo yinyo dudu, nino aye, ashe, ashe, ashe o, All right, thank you, brother.